remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. God, your grace is enough. Heaven reaching down to us. Your grace is enough for me. Oh, your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. For me. are here moving in our midst I worship you I worship you you are here working in this place I worship you I worship you you are here moving in our midst i worship you i worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship you because you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are because you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are here Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you. You are here in your mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. And you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. You are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you are. That is. you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop you never stop working even when i don't feel it you're working even when i don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working you never stop jesus you never stop Seems like all I could see was the struggle. Haunted by 
by ghosts that lived in my past bound up in shackles of all my failures wondering how long is this gonna last then you at this prisoner and say to me son stop fighting a fight that's already been won cause I am redeemed you set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains wipe away every stain now i'm not who i used to be i am redeemed all my life i have been called unworthy Named by the voice of my shame and regret. But when I hear you whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. Because I am redeemed. shake off these heavy chains wipe away every stain that i'm not who i used to be because i don't have to be the old man inside of me because his day is long dead and gone because i've got a new name a new life i'm not the same and i hope I am redeemed you set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains wipe away every stain now I'm not who I used to be cause I am redeemed When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well. My soul, it is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought is sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and i bear it no more praise the lord praise the lord soul it is well it is well with my soul and Lord hey 
face the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Please be seated. Good morning, church family. My name is Richard Bell, and I'm your center elder delivering our communion meditation today. It's officially time for March Madness, and boy, madness is what we've seen so far in this year's tournament. It's the first time ever that not a single number one seed has made it to the last eight teams to survive. For those of you who don't follow college basketball, March Madness is a yearly tournament where over 60 teams compete for the ultimate crown of national championship. The road to this championship requires a team to win six consecutive games, always knocking out your competition. Lose, and you go home. Today, for those Longhorn fans out there, you've got a pretty big game in order to earn your ticket to the Final Four. My wife will disagree. <laughs> so will I. My Jayhawks got knocked out way too early. While I love this time of the year and what March Madness brings, many of you who know me well know that basketball has and always will be a huge part of my life at an even deeper level. I started playing when I was young, probably first or second grade. I played most of my middle school and high school years, eventually working my way onto a college team for a few years. I was able to be our high school team's captain for three years, earning county honors, playing in our all-star game. To this day, I still try to stay active enough to be able to play on a weekly basis, but I can tell you at 33, it gets a little harder each time to put on those shoes, loosen it up, and go out and play. But even now, Braxton, my oldest son, has really started to love playing the game, and I look forward to this journey in this sport with him. The reason I love basketball so much isn't just because of the camaraderie, the competition, or because I'm actually decent at it. No, at the core, similar to other sports, basketball is so much more than a game where you just put the ball through a net. Many lessons I've learned in my life have come from being able to play this game. Many of my best memories as well have come from times I've been around basketball. Early on, I can tell you, I was not a very good basketball player. In sixth grade, I actually remember being one of the bench warmers. I usually only played the last 30 seconds of any game. I was overweight, I was slow, and I was a terrible shooter. And I actually let this get, the, uh, get to me so much that I decided to quit the game in seventh grade and focus on baseball. But then some magic happened. I hit a little bit of a growth spurt, developed some more hand-eye coordination, and soon found that what I had previously not been very good at at all was now an area that I could actually excel. Along with that, the lessons I've learned from those early years helped me with perseverance and toughness. To add to this, I learned lessons in working with peers, leading through challenges, problem solving, and decision making, responsibility, and more. And as I previously said, I hold many dear memories from my time playing the game. In fact, I remember a time that my dad and I took a trip to play travel league basketball to Maryland and being able to be a player on the same team as my brother in my senior year. Those are special connections I may not have otherwise had. Now, while basketball and sports in general have so much they can teach us and give us, it's what we do with that knowledge and those experiences that determine the paths our lives take. But the question today is, what happens when that path on earth ends and there is no more basketball? Well, that gets me to one of the greatest lessons that we can learn from this game. In 1989, Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls found themselves down one point, three seconds left, to the at-home Warriors. After poor shooting first half, Jordan had been heating up but still found himself and the team at risk of losing. During the timeout, the Warriors uh, had the lead and the coach for the Bulls drew up a play to get Jordan the ball one last time for one more shot. The inbound play began, Jordan received the ball, the rest 
is history. His shot has gone down as one of the greatest in history and one of the most memorable. So, what's the lesson to learn from this, as well as many other buzzer beaters that came down to the last shot? The lesson here is that, like the NCAA tournament and Game 7s in the NBA, life also has its elimination moments. Once the game comes to an end, unfortunately, there's no going back. Most of you in here may already be winning the game, having put your trust in Jesus Christ so long ago. But for anyone here that hasn't, do not count on that last shot buzzer beater because we don't know if we'll make it or not. For every one of those shots that does go in, I can tell you from experience there are so many more that absolutely do not. We don't know when God will call us home. In fact, the only thing we can be certain of is this very moment sitting in front of us right now. If you're saved today, don't wait for somebody else to have that last shot as well. If you know a friend, a brother, or a neighbor who may not know the Lord, call them today. Text them and tell them about Jesus Christ. Work to get them an eternity in heaven before their game is over. As our biggest fan, the Lord wants us to win. He begs us to trust in his name. He wants us to win big, and he is cheering from the top of the stands. Answer his call today or help someone you know accept their pathway to eternity in heaven. It is the reason Jesus Christ was sent to the cross to die. It is the reason we observe the bread and the cup today. So take your shot and make it count. Let's pray. Dear Lord, today we come to you thankful of the time that you have given us here on earth. We know that eternity will be an amazing place to be, but we also know that there is so much about this world to love and adore, like our families, nature's beauty, and beyond. But just as we know this time will eventually come to an end and we will see you in heaven, there are some here that do not have the same reassurance. Work in our hearts today. Lord, help us out with our team of brothers and sisters here on earth. Help us get them to heaven as well. We ask this of you. In your name we pray. Amen.
Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, Luke 6, 38. I shared a bit of who I am a few moments ago and my love and history of the game of basketball, but what some of you might not know is that when I began my professional work as an adult, I taught for three years as a science teacher, and this morning I want to go back to that and give you a very, very mini lesson in science. The first law of thermodynamics states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. Even when you burn something, the matter and energy given off in the state of combustion becomes something new, like carbon dioxide, carbon, energy, etc. When God created this earth, he did so with only so much matter and energy that we can use at our fingertips. There is something similar, a moral principle in the Bible about good and evil. What you put into God's creation will bring a return for good or for evil. What you add to the well-being of life on earth, you will receive back in fulfillment. What you take and scratch and steal will be taken, scratched, and stolen back. God desires to multiply that good through us now while we're on earth. That's why he created the church. So I'd like to ask of you today to give because that's why God created us, to enjoy him and to bring joy to others. Giving is a part of this because your finances, although not directly given to the community or in direct manner to enable things like our children's work or uh, children's ministry, Wednesday activities or missions program beyond, have great work here on earth. Everything that you give goes towards the greater good of achieving his mission of Christ here on earth. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the blessings that you have provided so many of us. We thank you for the giving within our church family and for the opportunities you provide us to be able to make the impact in our community at large. We ask that you continue to guide this church with wisdom and continue to keep our hearts cheerful about giving and spending. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. I am here to uh, read the scripture readings today. They're from 1 Samuel, and there are several. Um, But before I do, I want to make a couple announcements. So if you've got time to get your Bible app out or your Bible or the Pew Bible, if you want to read along 1 Samuel in a few minutes. Um, First off, the Easter lilies to totally beautify the sanctuary here at the church. Uh, 66 lilies are required. Uh, As of this morning, the count is 29. So we'll have today and next Sunday to sign up for some lilies. So please do so so we can beautify our church. Also, I wanna 
talk about a, a, a new ministry that uh, we're involved in, uh, Kairos. It's a prison ministry. Began in 1976 in Rayford, Florida as a program called Curcio in prison based on the Curcio movement or Tres Dias, dubbed a short course in Christianity. The program has spread to six U.S. states by 1978. It was eventually renamed Kairos, which is a Greek term meaning God's special time. By 2018, Kairos Prison Ministry had become active in nearly 40 U.S. states and nine other nations. The mission of Kairos Prison Ministry is to share the transforming love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ to impact the hearts and the lives of the incarcerated men, women, youth, as well as their families to become loving and productive citizens of their communities upon their release. Matthew 25, 36 says, I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. I want to present a simple but powerful way that you could reach out to those that are incarcerated in the uh, upcoming 72-hour weekend, April 20th to the 23rd, by purchasing meal tickets. Meals there at, the, at a Kairos weekend are very special because the meals, they're not prison food. Some of the meals are prepared at a nearby restaurant and brought in, home cooked. Some meals are just purchased outright. Um, in November, there were, they brought in everybody got Whataburger, and boy, was that a hit. Um, but these meal tickets, I'm going to have, we're going to have these out there in uh, four year for the next three Sundays. A meal ticket, it's just 10 bucks. And that, at the meal, the prisoners, at every meal, the prisoners have a placemat like this, drawn by kids. This one here just says, God loves you. And along with that, there is a meal ticket that who purchased. This one was Hargill Baptist Church from Hargill, Texas. So if you want to participate, you can just purchase one of these for 10 bucks. Um, put your name, first name only is required, like uh, Rich, the 33-year-old from Brownsville, Texas. Um, so we could do it either, you know, you could put it in the white envelopes, you could put a check in the white envelopes, or cash in the white envelopes, uh, and just write, Kairos Prison Ministry, and if you put in, you know, 50 bucks, go ahead and fill five of these cards out. We're going to keep them whole, and then as they're filled out, just take them out and here, put it on the back. Once we get to the weekend, uh, the outside team will take all these cards, and they have paper cutters, and they will cut them all out like this so they can be individually given uh, to the prisoners at the meal. And, and it's powerful because those prisoners, they can see, you know, the food special, plus also, you know, someone that doesn't even know them. A total stranger would think enough about them to pay for that meal. And at, at our table back in November, it was remarkable. They would save they would take these with them back to the dorms and they would take the placemats as well. So it's a simple, easy way for us to reach out, be the hands and feet of Jesus to someone in prison. All right. The Bible verses today, they're all out of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel 1.20. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. 319, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, 
and he let none of the Samuel's words fall to the ground. 819, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. 10.1, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? 15, verses 24 through 28. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instruction. I was afraid of the men, so I gave in to them. Now I beg you, forgive my sin and come back with me so that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back with you. You have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught a hold of the hem of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. 16 verses 11 through 13. So he asked Jesse, all these, all the sons you have, there is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and they had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and in order anointed him in the presence of his brother. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Thanks, Jerry. I know several of you good folks have told me this is your last Sunday that you'll be leaving, so we wish you Godspeed, and we hope you'll come back in the early fall and, and continue to worship with us. We do appreciate our winter Texans who are so active and involved and faithful while they're down here, and maybe one day we'll come up where it's cooler and visit you, so... We are going through a, each book of the Bible, each Lord's Day, and it's not, not been easy to try to condense everything, but I'll try to get you out of here in a timely manner. Uh, the book of 1 Samuel takes place in a time of war like the book of Judges. There was once a quote from a great Cherokee warrior who was taken off of his lands and moved to a reservation and given a plow and a horse and told to become a farmer and he got really depressed and someone asked him what's wrong and he said what am I to do now that my beloved pastime of war and raiding is over it was just the way of life and that is what we see in the book of first and second Samuel and much of the Old Testament it is the end of the time of the judges and the beginning of a king in the book of First Samuel. And the main event, the biggest idea, the greatest idea that we see in the text is the anointing of David. And we know that through his family line, we'll get Jesus in the future. Uh, the main characters in the book, of course, God. There's a little boy that came home from Sunday school every Sunday, and they asked him, what'd you learn at church? And he said, about God, about God. That's what he always told them. So the book of uh, first Samuel deals with God, Israel, the Philistines, Samuel, the prophet, uh, the last judge, who's also a, a judge, and then Saul, and then David. Those are the main characters. There are a lot of minor characters, though. There's Hannah, the mother of Samuel. There's the high priest Eli and his wicked sons, Phinehas and Hopni. There's Jonathan, the son of Saul and brother-in-law of David. There's Goliath and the Philistine, that Philistine warrior we know about. There's David's dad, Jesse, and his brothers. There's Saul's daughters and 
several of David's wives that are mentioned, Ahimelech and the priest of Nob. There's the people of the village of Kalan that David saves. There's the fool Nabal and his wife Abigail, who later becomes David's wife. It's kind of like a soap opera if you read it. And there are so many others. There's Joab and Abishai, the brother of Joab, two of David's closest allies. There's the witch of Endor. There's a strange story that takes place there. And so the book of Samuel is also full of a lot of people that are just briefly mentioned. It is a book of people having to make hard choices. You ever found yourself in a spot where you have to make a decision and you know good and well someone's going to be mad at you? And you still have to choose what is right. And we see that throughout the book. There is Hannah, and she's married to a man who's a polygamist, has another wife, and she is torn between wanting a child and giving that child away. She wants God to give her a baby. She promises that she will do, uh, dedicate him to the Lord. And so when Samuel is born, she does so. And that had to be very difficult. There's the priest Eli, who I think in his heart he loved Israel. He loved his people and he loved God. But he has two sons that are just wicked. The Bible calls them evil and wicked. They are taking advantage of women who are coming to bring their gifts to the, to the priest and to the temple. And they're also taking uh, unsanctioned meat and eating it as they desired. And Eli has to make a decision. Am I going to do what's right and take them out of their office or am I just going to ignore it? He does confront it, uh, but he does nothing afterwards. And then there's Samuel. You've got to feel for Samuel. He's the guy that everybody wants to hate. He's the messenger, right? And he has to go to different people, especially Saul, and bring God's message to him. And also Eli when he was young. David. David is torn between being appointed as a new king, but also he does love his father-in-law Saul. He's married to his second daughter, he's, he loves Jonathan. They're like brothers. And so he's torn. He doesn't want to kill Saul because he knows he's God's anointed, but he also knows that God has made him the next king. There's Jonathan. You ever had a parent that was overbearing? You ever had someone in your family that you want to be loyal to, and yet they're difficult to deal with? And so Jonathan and his sisters are torn between their father and and David. They know that David is doing right, and he hasn't wronged Saul, and yet he's still their dad, Saul is. And then, of course, there's Israel, and they're torn apart between their loyalty to Saul and their loyalty to David. And it's basically by the tribes, the Benjamites, Saul's tribe stayed with him till the end for the most part. And all of us are going to have to make decisions sometimes that are difficult. And you and I know that we should choose what is right. We should follow God's will. Remember what Joshua said when the people came into the land? He told them to choose to follow God. But he said, if you want to follow the gods of the Amorites and all that, you can. But I'm telling you today, as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. And when Paul was writing to the church at Galatia, he said to them, for I am now... Uh, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. And then, of course, that classic verse when Peter and John are brought before the temple in the book of Acts, before the Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin, and they are put on trial. And they said, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. So they made it clear they weren't going to lie and go away. So I want to give you some sermonettes this morning from the book of Samuel, for Samuel. I'm going to give you a bunch of little ones. And I think not all of them are going to apply to your faith situation this morning, but, and you're certainly not going to remember them. But try to see if one or two might apply to you this morning. So from Hannah, the first thing we see from Hannah is that when we're in torment, we need to turn our heart to God and we need to turn to prayer. 
Now, you may think, I haven't had a close re relationship with God in a long time, and he doesn't want to hear from me. Well, that's not true. And we often hear, well, the only, only time people want to turn to God is when they're in crisis. He still wants to hear from you, even if he hasn't in a long time. And so we see Hannah, who is a devout woman, but she has a crisis on her hands. A woman's worth in that day and time was her ability to give birth and bring especially sons into the family. Uh, and she was unable to. She could not conceive. And so she's tormented by the other wife. And she goes to God and she prays. And her husband even thinks she's drunk when she's praying so uh, deeply to the Lord. But another lesson from her is this. When you make a promise to God, you need to keep it. We need to follow through with our word. Hannah made a promise to dedicate her firstborn son to God, and it was very difficult. It's, it's hard enough to put one on the school bus, let alone take them to the temple and walk away and let some man raise your child. And yet she did what she said she was going to do, and it was a blessing to the people. And so too many people make promises when they're in crisis and then they forget them. They, we had a, a, an incident where a, a boy was killed in our community when I was in my last church and a lot of people got baptized afterwards. And 9-11, a, a lot of people uh, came to church after some funerals. And so many drift away as quickly as they came in, they go back away from the Lord. And so keep your promise to him. And when you were baptized into him, you made a promise to make him Lord of your life. All right, the next one is from Eli and his sons. We need to make sure we don't have a blind spot for the people that we love. We hold a standard for other people, but when it's our own family, we don't seem to, to have a problem. And that was the situation with Eli. His sons were priests. And they should have been dealt with. Actually, what they were doing could have brought them the death penalty in this day and time. And yet he didn't go through with uh, dealing with them. And they were abusing their power and authority. And so you and I, we need to make sure that we're not judgmental. But at the same time, we don't ignore sin in our own house and in those that we love. It is, if it's wrong for us, if God says it's wrong, then it's wrong. And uh, you and I need to also remember we need to be our own person in Christ. Establish our own identity in Him. We're His workmanship. We're created in G Christ Jesus for good works, prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so we see here with the love that, that uh, God has for for Saul and for David and for Jonathan, some made the right choices and others didn't. But even Jonathan and even Saul's uh, daughter, who was David's wife, recognized that David was in the right and they made the right choice. They didn't allow their loyalty and love for their father to allow him to do the things that he wanted to do. When we went to the Kairos prison ministry closing program, there was a young man that got up and he told us that he was the uncle of Patrick Mahomes. And he said, I'm kind of the black sheep of the family. Well, he had made some mistakes. He actually said that my mother got arrested, my dear old mom, because I was dealing drugs out of the home. And yet in Christ, he can become a new person. He can turn it over to God and he can change. And so when we think about family loyalty, loyalty, the Bible says to obey your parents' children in the Lord. That means that you shouldn't just follow them and ignore and act like they do if they're not following the Lord. So another lesson, and this one is that we should not trust in religious symbols, but we should trust in the Lord. Religious symbols don't make us right. And so the Israelites, they were getting whipped pretty bad by the Philistines. They were a warfaring people that had actually defeated the Egyptians at one time, and now they have invaded the territory. They're a coastal people, a seafaring people, and they were a thorn in the flesh for Israel. And so they decided, why don't we take the Ark of the Covenant out to battle with us? We'll cover it up because only the high priest is allowed to see the Ark, 
and we'll take it out there and we'll have the victory. And so that's what they did. And guess what happened? They lost the battle and they lost the ark. And it caused Eli to, to fall over and die when he heard about it. It was just an atrocity. It was terrible for Israel to lose the symbol of God in their community. And we need to recognize that as Christians, that we don't need to put our, our trust just in symbolic Christianity. And many times we as Christians can jeopardize just like they did the ark, our family, our reputation, our careers, by thinking that some type of token or symbol will do the trick. I go to worship. I attend church. I got baptized. I take communion. That alone doesn't make us right with God. We need to make sure that in the heart, just like David, we're right with him. Spurgeon said it this way. He was a famous preacher years ago. He said, instead of attempting to get right with God, these Israelites set about devising superstitious means of securing the victory over their foes. And so think about that in, in our own faith walk. The next one I want to consider is that we need to be careful what we ask God for. <laughs> be careful what you ask for. Saul was given to Israel as their first king, but it was because they demanded a king because they wanted to be like everyone else around them, all the other people around them. God knew they would ask for a king or that they would have a king, and he had it planned out. And so they demanded that, and Samuel said, this is a bad thing for you to do. So he gave them a tall, handsome, horrible leader named Saul. He starts out okay, and then it goes downhill from there. He made him king when he was about 30 years old, and he reigned until he was 72. So they had to put up with Saul and a divided kingdom for 42 years because they wanted a king, and they wanted it now. He was the wrong tribe. Saul was a Benjamite, and the prophecy says the scepter would not depart from Judah. And so David was the right tribe. It was the wrong time. If they'd have just waited 10 more years, God would have given them David. And it was on the wrong terms. They were demanding that God do something and give them a king right now. And so often we behave the same way, don't we? We make purchases we can't afford. We take jobs that we hate. We send our kids to very liberal universities. And at the end of the day, we're very discontent. We want to be like churches sometimes. We want to do what other churches are doing. So sometimes we water down our positions. We compromise on our doctrine. Because we want to be like all the others around us. As young people, sometimes we waste so much of our lives partying it up. Because we want to be like everyone else. Another lesson uh, from Saul's failures this time. Don't try to rationalize or justify disobedience when we think about our relationship with God. Saul had a lot of transgressions. The Bible says they were many. He offered an unauthorized burnt offering because his men were... He always had an excuse. He always had a reason. He always had a justification. He said, we've waited seven days for you, Samuel, and so I went ahead and did the sacrifices. Well, you're not authorized to do that, Saul. You're a king, not a priest, not a prophet, and you should have waited. They did the same thing to Moses, making a golden calf, because you were gone so long, Aaron said. The people were getting upset, and they, they made me do this. Another thing he did, he made a foolish oath. At one time, he and his men, Saul was not a coward. He was a, a warrior. And yet he was going to battle. His son Jonathan had gone up to a garrison and attacked the Philistines. He and his, his armor bearer, and they had killed 20 Philistines. And they started a rout, and the, the Philistines were in a panic, and so they're chasing them. And Saul makes a dumb command, a dumb oath. He says, Cursed is any man that eats anything until I've taken vengeance on my enemies. And, and everybody knows in the military, you've got to feed your troops. Or in any, any part of life, you have to give people some nutrition or they wear out. They tire out. And the Bible says they became exhausted. And what did they do? They start killing animals that they find on their raid as they're attacking the Philistines. And they start eating them with the blood in them. And that's a, a commandment that they should not have done. And so he starved his own army. 
Well, Jonathan went through a place in the woods, and the Bible says that there was honey dripping down. And so Jonathan doesn't know about his dad's ridiculous uh, oath. And so he takes his spear, and he gets some of that honey, and he takes it, and he says, see how my countenance is brightened already in the King James? And he's, he eats a little bit of honey. So afterwards, prideful Saul says, I'm going to have you killed. I'm going to kill you, Jonathan, because I found out you ate something when I said not to. And if it had not been for the men who loved Jonathan, who rallied around him, Saul would have killed his own son and one of his best warriors. But he always had an excuse. And so the, what broke the camel's back or what cost him his kingdom was he was given an order to go to the Amalekites and destroy everything. And he went and he brought back their king Agag and he brought back the finest of the animals from, from this attack on the Amorites. And Samuel says, what is that noise I hear? Is that cows mooing and sheep? What do they do? Bleat. And they're coming towards him. And Saul says, I saved the best animals to sacrifice to our God. He always had a reason. Think about that today because I hear a lot of Christians, I hear many in the church today that have adopted secular world views and they have a good reason why. They say, well, it's better to do it this way or do it that way. If God has given us a clear command to obey, we have to follow him. And then another one. Be patient and wait on God rather than compromise and do it your way or our way. Don't come down to Saul's level when you're dealing with people. You keep your faith. You keep your trust in the Lord. Don't stoop down. David had two opportunities to get rid of Saul and have the kingdom in his hand. One time, Saul went into a cave, and David and his men were hiding there, and, and he snuck up behind him, and he shamed him by cutting a piece of his robe off of him. Another time, he and Joab's brother went down into the camp, and they stole Saul's spear and some of his belongings, and then they held him up the next day. And Joab's brother, Ahim Ahimelech, he says, let's just run the spear through him and be done with him. We've got him. And David says, I will never touch God's anointed one. David waited for God to do what he was going to do. And so we know that at the end of the book, Saul and Jonathan, it's very tragic. They're fighting the Philistines. And Saul is mortally wounded. He's going to die. And he tells his armor bearer, run me through because I'm not going to fall into the hands of those Philistines. They will gouge out my eyes. They will torment me. And his armor bearer says, I'll never do such a thing. And so Saul takes his own life on his own sword. And then the armor bearer kills himself. And Jonathan and the brothers, his two other brothers, they're both killed in this heat of battle. And so they find themselves dying in a tragic way, the end of their lives, although that was a bit heroic for warriors. Saul's paranoia, his jealousy destroyed his life. I think he literally went insane with time. It drove him over the edge. He allowed his power and his position to take charge of him. And the Bible says that an evil spirit even came upon him because he chose that way. But what if? What if Saul had loved David and recognized his ability, that he's killed his tens of thousands, and he had supported him and there had been a transition in the kingdom where he had the blessing of the older king upon the younger one, where his family would have been happy and his kids wouldn't have been torn between their allegiance, where the tribes would have been united. And so I'll conclude this morning by saying finish well. Saul started off well, and then it went downhill. And so many Christians start off well. They do a good job at the beginning. But as they walk along, they make a lot of poor choices, and we all have. But what if we could turn it around? For Saul, there was no way to turn it around. But for us, as Jerry was talking about with Kairos, you know, some of us would be in there with them if we had gotten caught, to be honest. And so God has blessed us. And 
we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And when we come to Jesus, we have an opportunity that these folks in the Old Testament did not have. There was an old song. It says, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine will the glory be. And then it talks about leading us to Calvary. When we come to the cross, it's level ground. And we can come to him this morning if we never have. As we prepare this time to stand, we'll be singing our, our song of invitation. And you have an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And have a clean heart in him. Let's be standing. thank you for this opportunity to worship. Lord, I ask a special prayer now for those that are returning back to their permanent homes, that they'll have a, a safe trip and that they'll have good health and be able to return uh, in the next year and join us. We pray now for those in our congregation. We lift a special prayer up for Don and Laura Noel. We pray that you'll give him a peace that only you can. We ask a prayer now for all those on our prayer list. And we ask that you bless this new week as we begin here worshiping you. Help us to be your hands and feet and also your mouthpiece. Give us integrity in our walk and character that people will see Christ in us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Go in peace, God bless. Today is uh, Michaela Elbert's birthday, and she came down just for that, I believe. So, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday 